We're in Ephesians, the book of Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and so if you're able to, and willing, if you join me in standing in honor of the reading of God's Word, we'll read the first four verses. And, uh, of course, we're turning to Ephesians 6, and we're talking about uh, stewardship of the family. Ephesians chapter 6, verse number 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Now, I'm not preaching on this necessarily. However, notice the first verse is to obey, and notice who it is written to. Children. Children are to obey. The next verse doesn't say, children, honor thy father and mother. It is referencing to everyone. Children are to obey, but even adults are to honor their parents. And so everyone should honor their parents. Now, I don't, I don't have to obey my parents anymore, namely, mostly because my parents don't tell me what to do anymore, right? Their job is rearing and raising is done. And uh, now sometimes we'll get together and dad will tell me what to do and I'll remind him, I don't have to do what you tell me to do. Uh, but I do have to honor. I need to honor my parents. And can I tell you that, though we're not preaching on this necessarily, that honoring your father and mother is the first commandment with, with promise. That's not to children, that's to everyone. Children are to obey. I'm still to honor my father and, and mother. Verse number three, that it may be well with thee, and, the, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the, what's that last word? The Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, um, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. When we talk about uh, stewardship in regard to family, and we're going to try to cover every, uh, um, every spectrum of, of a family this, this evening is that we can. Uh, certainly, if we're preaching on the family, we could preach for um, a week of Sundays and a month of Sundays and not, not exhaust the topic, but We're going to try to talk about every age group and every age in regard to stewardship, excuse me, stewardship of family. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll get into the message. Our Father in heaven, I'm thankful, very thankful for the privilege. It's just an amazing, wonderful, great privilege. Honored, I'm humbled, Lord, for that privilege to stand behind this sacred desk and open your word. What a great privilege it is to have your word, to have the holy word of God, the the complete word of God, that what you want us to have, your your uh, uh, thoughts, your mind in, uh, in, in black and white in front of me. I'm so thankful to get to be able to know you through your word. And then to have the, the, the even greater privilege to take it and read it and explain it and preach it to your dear people here. I'm so thankful for that privilege. I pray you'd bless us tonight as we preach. I pray that you'd fill me with your spirit. You'd use me. Help me say exactly what you want me to say, not what I want to say. Uh, uh, nothing from me, everything from you, Lord, I pray. Fill each hearer with your spirit. Lord, I, if, uh, if I'm doing what you want me to do, but your people are not open to hear, they don't have ears to hear, they're not filled with the spirit, then we're not a complete uh, uh, package tonight. And so I pray, God, that each hearer will be filled with your spirit, that we would uh, hear the word of God and be doers of the word, not hearers only, we pray. We ask it all in Jesus' name, for his sake we pray it. Amen. Thank you. May be seated. I've mentioned these principles every service. The first Sunday we preached on principles, uh, on, on stewardship. We mentioned the principles of stewardship way back in February 18th. And we said these, we gave these five principles. And these five principles are, are applicable. They apply to every area of stewardship. And I told you at that first service, you'll probably get tired of hearing them. But I think they bear uh, uh, repeating each and every Sunday when it comes to stewardship, because uh, although I kind of go a different direction, each one of these principles are applicable, are necessary, are important to us in regard to stewardship. So number one, the first principle, a steward is responsible for something that belongs to someone else. The steward is not the owner. The steward is the one who's taking care of something that was given or, or, or allowed for him to be used, is responsible for something that belongs to another person. That's what a steward is. Number two, a steward will eventually give an account for w- of what was assigned to him. There's a day coming. There's a reckoning day coming. We read the verse this morning in the book of Hebrews. As it is appointed unto man once to die and after this the judgment. What have you done with what God has given you? Every steward, we m- mentioned that, that talked about the, the kingdom of God is like the Lord, the master who, who leaves his stewards something uh, and each one had something different. One had one talent, one had two talents, one had five talents. And, and there was a day coming where he was going to reckon, uh, he was going to reconcile uh, what they had with what he, they were given 
what they have when, with what they were given. There's each steward, every steward will eventually give an account of what was assigned to him. Number three, although each steward is given a different ration, each steward is given the same responsibility. You may not have what someone in the seat beside you or in the row in front of you has, but you have the same responsibility to be faithful with what God's given you. We've mentioned this uh, almost every service, but the idea of equality uh, is not, uh, though, though God gives things equally or gives uh, his grace, uh, um, he, the idea of equality is not found in Scripture. When I say uh, equality, uh, we treat everyone equally. But can I tell you that God gives grace to whom he'll give grace? And he, he, the Bible says about the talents that he give everyone to his several ability. You know people that are smarter than you. And if you don't, then you know people that aren't, aren't as smart as you, right? <laughs> to, to, I, to have the idea or have the, the, to think, well, everyone has the same uh, um, intellect it is, doesn't make any sense at all. We know people that have, we know people that are taller. We know people that have more abilities in other areas, have more wisdom. God does not give everyone equally. Now, I'm not saying that we treat uh, people differently. I'm just saying that, that we have several abilities. And we talked about that last week, that he gives us abilities for the calling that he calls us to. Number four, a steward will be trusted with more once he shows he has proven himself to be faithful with what he has. Uh, remember we said, don't sit there and think, well, I wish I had what so-and-so has. Well, why don't you be faithful with what you've been given and God might give you more. Well, I wish, if I had more, think about the man with one talent. If I had more, I'd be more faithful. Well, just be, ta- be faithful with what you've been given and the one who had five that came back with 10, he was given the one. You've been faithful with much. You'll be given much. Number five, a faithful steward's greatest desire is to bring praise to his Lord. It's not to please ourselves, but to please the one from whom we received the responsibility, received the talent. It's to be, uh, uh, to please the Lord. And we were, we preached out of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Next Sunday, we're going to get back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We started there next Sunday when we talk about being a steward of the gospel. That's the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And so we've taken that idea that a man, a steward must be found faithful in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and, and we're using that in several areas. So we talked about the principles. Then we talked about the next week, we preached on the stewards and the uh, stewardship in the workplace, and then stewardship in finances. Last week, we talked about stewardship in callings and, and talents, or callings and gifts, and, and how that last, uh, last week we talked about how that God calls us to something. He gives us a calling, and then he equips us for that calling. We sometimes get it backwards. We look at our, our gifts and say, well, what does God want me to do? No, he'll give you a calling, and he will equip you with the gifts and the talents that you need to complete that calling, to, to uh, the, the verse that was, or the word that was used we, in the book of Ephesians we talked about last week was vocation. He'll give you a vocation. He'll give you a calling. He'll give you a, a, a responsibility, a, a, a task, and you say, well, I don't know if I can do that. He'll give you the gifts and the talents necessary to accomplish the calling he gives you. And then tonight, uh, the stewardship of family. Ephesians 6 speaks about the family. In fact, Ephesians 6, really, uh, uh, the idea here begins back in Ephesians chapter 3 and 4. We were preaching on this a few weeks ago. And um, he begins to say, verse 1, I, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, this is what we were preaching on last week, uh, uh, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. And what's that worthiness? And then uh, the rest of 4 and 5 and 6, it's just, it's statement after statement of something that we need to do, things we need to set aside, things that we should embrace and be. And in those, in Ephesians chapter 5, it, uh, we see the relationship of a husband and a wife and how it represents the church. And then, as we, excuse me, as we get into chapter 6, it talks about children obeying your parents, honoring your father and mother. And then it says this, Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. I'd like to point out in regard to this verse that the one responsible for the nurture and admonition in this passage is the father. The one responsible, let me say it again, the one responsible 
for the nurture and admonition is the father. Look what it says. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Somehow along the way, somewhere we've got the idea that the, 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 the person or the, the position of raising children belongs to the mother. The dad works. The dad works hard and he provides. And then he comes home and does nothing else. He has no interest in the children. And the mother raises the children. But that's not a biblical principle. The biblical principle here is that the fathers are responsible. The father is the one that is to uh, 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 provoke not the children to wrath, but the father is to bring up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now, when, when, when our children were, were younger, they're still, certainly still young, but when, we didn't, when they were not in school, uh, my wife did not work. She was in the home all the time. And so there was a lot of times I was not there. My wife was the only one there with them. But can I tell you that before I left, not necessarily every morning, but when we had children, I set the standard, the, the, the decisions that were made were set by the father. It was my responsibility. I bore that responsibility and I gave to her the instruction. Now, my wife and I say this, she doesn't like it when I say this, but she's, she's smarter than me. People know that. She uh, borderline genius, and she's done IQ tests, and she's, she's far smarter than me. And I can tell you, she could say, this is what we need to do, this is what we need to do, this is what we need to do. And I could say, well, that sounds like a good idea to me. But a godly wife is going to say, what does my husband want me to do? And I'm thankful for a godly wife that, that is quite capable, more, more than capable. She could parent me. She tries to sometimes. I say, I'm not one of your kids. Husbands, can you relate? Amen. <laughs> I, she's quite capable, but I'm thankful for a wife that, when we look back at chapter 5, submits to her own husband. That allows her husband, the father, to say, all right, this is the standard, this is the rule, this is what we're going to do. And she embraces it. Can I tell you this, husband and wife, father and mother... Uh, um, your life, your, your, uh, your home will be a nightmare if you're not on the same page. If dad has a rule and mom has a rule and it's a rule like this for, for dad one day and, and then you go to, to mom and it's a different rule for mom, it will, your, it will be a nightmare in the home. If you have two s- different standards, uh, dad set the, the standards. The responsibility for uh, the, the upbringing, for the nurture and admonition comes from the Father, is on the Father, that the, the responsibility goes to the Father. I, n- number two, let me point out this. I'd like to point out that the purpose for this nurture and admonition is to prevent them from being in wrath. Can I say it's talking about not anger from the children, but it's talking about the wrath of God. Now, it says this, and you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. That does not mean don't ever make your children angry. That's not what it's saying. Study the word wrath in your Bible. It's literally talking about the the fire or anger and and judgment of God. That's what it's talking about. When when you see that word, it's not talking about I don't make my son mad. Because can I tell you that there are some things that I've decided for our family and for my son that he doesn't like and, and can make him mad? We have a society that walks around on eggshells trying not to make their children angry. That is not what this verse is talking about. This verse is talking about the wrath of God, meaning I don't want to provoke them or put them in a position where God's wrath falls on them. As a father, I have a responsibility to train them and and to raise them in such a way that, that... God is pleased with their decisions. God's happy with them and not that his wrath falls on them. It does not mean, well, don't ever make your kids angry. Because, listen, I've made some decisions. Some parents need to learn this real big word. It's all of two letters. It goes like this. No. Can I tell you this? There's sometimes we say no just so they can hear the word no. Well, people don't like that very much. There's sometimes we say no just so they can get used to the fact that they can't do everything that they want to do. Well, 
Remember last Sunday morning we talked about the works of the flesh and the, and the filling of the Spirit? What do we have to do to walk in the Spirit? We have to tell our flesh, no. we got to resist the flesh, constantly say no to the flesh. And if I'm constantly saying yes to my children, they're not learning that I have to say no sometimes. And so uh, um, we, we must say no at times. It prevents them from being under the wrath of God. No. All right. Uh, let me point out this. Number three, I'd like to point out that to do that, to prevent them from being in wrath, under the wrath of God, I have to do as a father, I have to do two things. Notice what it says. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition. Now, if you go look those words up, nurture, often, it's funny how uh, words have, uh, we've talked about consolation and Barnabas on, the, and on Wednesday nights in the book of Acts. And we think of the word console as, you, you know, you put your arm around him and, oh, there, baby, you'll be all right. And that's not necessarily what a consolation is. A consolation is an encourager. Hey, you can do this. It builds people up. It's, it's not someone who encourages someone to do wrong or, or that they're going to be okay. No, it's someone that's going to, to build them. Hey, you can do this. You, you can do this. And when I say okay, many times we think about someone consoling someone in their sin and, and not helping them get out of it. A consoler is the very opposite of that. Consoler is, hey, you can do this. You can get up out of this sin. You can trust the Lord and you can do right. Um, this word nurture is another word that kind of gets misconstrued over the years from when it was translated in 1611. The, the word nurture, uh, we think of as it only building someone up, but the word nurture literally means 18, uh, uh, Webster's 1828 dictionary, uh, um, that which promotes growth, education, and instruction. Meaning nurture is to point something. Uh, let me use Jason for a moment. Nurture is this. Uh, see the doors? That's your goal. Okay? Your eyes on the goal, door? That's where you're, okay. All right, nurture is this. That's where you're going. This is how you do it. Take one step, put it in front of the other. Just keep going, keep going. Uh, take one step, put it in front of the other. Okay, stop right there. Instruction, or nurture is instruction, guiding someone. Hey, this is where you go. All right, come back. Stay right there, in the middle there. Admonition is this. Gentle reproof, counseling against a fault, instruction in duties, caution, direction. Nurture is to set a path. Admonition is to keep them in the path. Nurture and admonition. Okay, so Jason, you've seen the goal. Uh, this time, don't walk toward the goal, all right? Now I'm going to say something different. Walk toward the goal, but don't walk toward the goal, all right? He's, he has, I have no idea what I'm saying here. I'm not supposed to do it. All right, no, 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 back this way, 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 this way. Back, back this way. All right, or no, back, back this way, back this way. All right, thank you, you can be seated. Back this way, no, I'm joking, sit down. <laughs> All right, so when a father is responsible for the nurture and admonition of the, the Lord, what he's responsible for is setting the course for his children and keeping them in that course. That's a father's responsibility. Now, we're getting to the message. This is all part of introduction. I know you're thinking, he's already to point number four. That's the introduction. We still got a couple pages left. I'd like to point out that this nurture and this admonition is of the Lord. Back to this stewardship idea. These children are not my children. They are a, 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 Psalm 127.3 says, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. I am raising God's children for him. I'm raising them in the nurture and admonition of David Bragg. No. I'm raising them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. It's not what I want them for them. It's what the Lord wants for them. And so uh, uh, what we need to focus on is being stewards, having stewardship in a family. Now, some will say, Pastor, that sounds all great, but I don't have a 13-year-old son. I recognize that there are three categories of people in this room. The first is those that don't have children. 
Um, maybe, um, maybe you're not married. Maybe you're too young to have children. Uh, maybe you've been married but don't have children yet. But you don't have children. Never had children. No children. Number two, the second ca- category is those who have children still in the home. And then the third category is those who have had children or have children, but they're no longer raising them. They're no, they're no longer in the home. Uh, Brother Payne's here. Brother Payne has four children, and none of them live at home, right? Amen. Not to take care of them, right? <laughs> and so many are in that category. You're either in one of those three categories. I don't have any children. I have no, no children at all. Um, I have children at home, or I've already had my children, they're raised, and they're gone. Can I tell you that I, can, I think there are biblical principles in regard to stewardship of a family in every one of those categories. I'd like to point those out this evening. Number one, for the first category, those who do not have children. Let me say this. Those that do not have children assist parents in their goal, raising them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, where you can. Can I say that I am thankful for, and I, I, I certainly don't mean to, mean to embarrass anyone. I'm thankful. There's two young ladies in our church, uh, uh, Miss Schrock, and I don't know where she's at. Maybe she's in the nursery. Uh, uh, Miss Becker. Miss Schrock teaches my children. Miss Becker teaches my children in Sunday school. They don't have children of their own. I am thankful that they have come alongside the Bragg family and assisted us in training them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know what? Sometimes we have this. And let, me, let me go back to, uh, um, let me read you a passage. Genesis chapter 24, the Bible says, And Abraham Abraham was old and well stricken in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said unto his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, the earth, and thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell, but thou shalt go uh, unto my country and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son Isaac. Now, I don't know that uh, uh, we, uh, uh, I don't know what the name of this servant is, uh, um, but this eldest servant of Abraham, think about the enormity of this task. He's asking someone to go find a spouse for his son. Abraham is an old man, he can't go back himself. So he asks a servant to go, and does this servant go and just do what he wants? And we don't have time to go through this entire passage. Uh, but this, this servant doesn't go and just do what he wants. No, the servant seeks the Lord's will to be a help to Abraham. It's not the servant's son. It's not his son. And yet, he is assisting in Abraham and accomplishing the task. Remember what God said about Abraham? I know him. I know that he'll raise his children to follow me. I know Abraham, but here is a task, a monumental task, I, I would say, that God told, that Abraham told his servant, I want you to go find the wife. Can't find a Canaanite wife. Go back home and find a wife. And when the servant did that, it was not just a small task. The, 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 the servant sought the Lord's face and sought the Lord's desire. Can I tell you that sometimes And I certainly don't mean to be critical. I've never, I have a a very short time, but I'm not really in this position to say, well, it's easy for you to say you're a a, a father of four. But sometimes what I see is people that don't have children kind of have a bitter attitude. Well, it's not my children. Nothing I can do about it. And, And I say that it's easy for me to say that because I have children. But there's been times I look back on, on my life, and I'm not trying to uh, be used as an example, but I can tell you that I've poured into a lot of young people that, aren't my, that weren't my children. I look, back on, I look back on my life. I'm thankful for the men that poured into my life that were not my father. The men. I'm thankful for men like Scott Barker, who didn't have any children of his own, but poured into my life, invested in my life. And Dave Jones and didn't have any sons, had two daughters, and poured into my life. And, and I'm telling you, name after name after name of people, uh, two, two of my Sunday school teachers I have the privilege of pastoring, Brother, 
pain. It's amazing. I have two, two men that taught me in Sunday school that I have the, that Brother Payne are two of the most respectful church members here. They could say, I taught you in Sunday school. It's a, men that poured into me that are godly men. I'm, I cannot tell you how thankful I am for men like that. So you know what you can do? You say, well, I don't have any children. You know what you can do? You can assist parents that are in this church or, or other areas that have children, that have the desire to raise their children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You can be involved in Sunday school, and you can be involved in children's church, and you can be involved uh, with, you don't even have to be a, have a title as a teacher. You can just say, hey, I want to invest, I want to uh, help these parents raise these children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Don't have a, and I, listen, I'm not saying this in an arrogant spirit. Don't have a pity party. I, I, I'm not looking down on anyone. Help, I'm, the Lord knows my heart. I'm just saying, if you're not in the position to have children, help others. Help others. Number two, you don't have any children. Don't, along with this, don't do anything that would undercut those parents and their desire to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Including grandparents. Including grandparents. Let me give you a quick story. I don't know that I would say this if she were in the room, but she's in heaven now. I remember my wife's grandmother. When we were in Texas, her, her granny. That's a southern thing. Nobody in the north calls her grandmother granny. And that's a southern thing. What? Oh, Mrs. Wright's a granny. Yeah, okay. She looks like a granny, too. I'm joking, I'm joking, I'm joking. My wife's granny, when you think of a granny, she looked like the granny with Tw Tweety Bird. She, that, was, that was, you know what I'm talking about? My wife's granny. It was my, my father-in-law's mother. She, would go, she lived with my in-laws, and she attended church with us. And um, she would watch the kids sometimes during choir practice before church. Now, at the church, this, is, this was a dangerous thing, but literally a stone's throw. You could throw a stone from the church and hit a donut shop. And it was good donuts, too, and kolaches. That was a dangerous thing. We had to make a rule that kids couldn't go over there between Sunday school and church because they'd be coming in late to church with donuts in their hands. So we ended up putting a fence across the back of the property to make it harder for people to go over to the donut shop. And you had to cut through the back of the property. But uh, invariably, every Sunday, somebody's got donuts before Sunday school. They've stopped the donut shop. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, the donut shop. I don't even know bake bakery donuts. Everybody just called it the donut shop. It was a mom and pop owned by uh, some um, Cambodian um, folks, uh, sweet, sweet people we've witnessed too many times. Anyway, we're in, we're in uh, choir practice. Do you remember this? We're in choir practice, and my granny, or my wife's granny, uh, she had donuts, and, she, and Allison was back there, and Allison, I don't know, she was probably three, four, and she said, now I'm going to give you this donut, honey, she said, but don't tell your mama I gave it to you. And I remember my wife having to have a very difficult conversation with her grandmother, saying, Granny, if you're going to give her a donut, just give her a donut. But never tell my daughter not to tell or to hide it from her parents. Look, do not undercut a parent's authority with their children. Don't be critical of their, their parents. If you're working with a young person, don't be critical. Now, I, I, there's times I, I worked with teenagers where their parents were not serving the Lord, and, and, and you recognize what you have to recognize and say, listen, you learn what you do, and you just keep on going forward. But it's not benefiting anyone for you to undercut and be critical. By the way, parents, husband, don't be critical of mom to children. Mom, don't be critical of dad to your children. Now, I don't know that I have a verse for this, but I have watched this over and over and over again. The parent who undercuts another parent or another authority always loses their authority with their children. It happens 
I, I guess maybe the principle is you reap what you sow. But I'm telling you, I've seen it happen so many times where a parent will undercut, the, they'll constantly cut on their teachers, constantly cut on the youth pastor, constantly cut on whatever leadership there is. And before long, the children see, well, the, the, the authority doesn't matter. It's just an authority figure, and they begin to rebel against their parents next. And so anyway, that's free. That wasn't even in my notes or anything. Uh, um, assist parents where you can. B, don't do anything that would undercut the parents. Uh, 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 the next thought under number one, that, that for those that don't have children, the last one. If you hope to have children one day, decide now to make these principles your own. If you're 13, you're 14, you're 15, you're 16, 18, 19, 20, you say you don't have children yet. Determine now what principles you will guide your, fa- your family by. Don't wait until it's too late. I- I'm thankful for the, the, the teaching and the training that I had as a teenager that when, when I met a, 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 a woman, a, a young lady to marry, I had already had some things, all right, this is what we're going to do with our family. I'd already determined this is how we're going to raise a family. And I was looking, it helped in finding a spouse because I was looking for one who was lined up with those principles. So you say, well, I don't have children. This, this, uh, uh, this idea of um, stewardship in regard to a family, that doesn't apply to me. Well, it might one day. So determine that you're going to live by these principles now before you just wake up one day and you say, my life is a mess because I didn't make those determinations earlier. All right, the the second one, for those who have children in the second category, for those who have children in the home. We talked about it already to some degree, but number one, let me say this, decide what outcome you want for your children. Nurture and admonish. The nurture and admonishment. Admonition. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. The, the, the direction you point them is the direction they will go. So point them in that direction. Now, I'm not taking away uh, uh, freedom of choice. I tell you that we're God's children. We don't always do what God wants us to do. Right? So I'm not taking away freedom of choice. But when they're young, when, when it's early, if you're a parent, Determine what you want for your children. What is that goal? Don't just go willy-nilly through life. If you're going to be a proper uh, um, steward of what God has given you, make a determination, this is what I want for my children. I can tell you a few things that my wife and I have already determined, we've talked about, what we want for our children. We say you want them to, to make money or you want them to be in the ministry. or No, no, the, the, I, I'll let God call them. But here's some principles that we want for our children, every one of our children. We want them to love God. I'm going to tell you this right now, and I don't mean to sound... I I will feel like as a parent, if I raise my children and they don't love God, I'm not talking about they don't do this, this, and this. If I raise my children and they don't love God, I will feel like I have failed. Because that is the direction that I want them to go. I want them to love God. What's the greatest commandment? What's the greatest commandment? To love God. Whose children are they? They're the Lord's children. They're not my children. I'm not, I'm not making the decision. Uh, 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 I'm not saying, well, these are my children. I'll do it. No, these are the Lord's children. They, they're God's children. What do I want for them? I want them to love the Lord. First and foremost. I want them to love others. You say, where are you getting these novel ideas? (laughs) The greatest and the second greatest commandment. Love the Lord and love others. There's there's a whole host of other things that we've talked about that we, we, but, but we parent with a purpose in mind. This is the goal. This is the plan. Parents have some kind of plan or purpose to point them to. Say, Pastor, do you want your children to be in the ministry? It doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me. 
I mean, if the Lord would, would use them, that'd be great in the ministry. If the, if the Lord wants them to be on the mission field or be a pastor or, or, or to, to drive a truck or deliver mail or uh, um, work as a scientist or whatever it is, that doesn't, it does, that does not matter to me. What they do does, as, a, as a earthly vocation does not matter to me as long as they're following their heavenly vocation. I want them to please the Lord. Because they belong to the Lord. So parents, the first thing that you need to do is decide what they, That's part of the nurture. They're not my children. So what do you want them to be? I didn't, I'm not talking about a scientist or a, a, um, a doctor. or a, That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about what kind of person you want them to be. You want them to love the Lord? Then train them. In, so number two, dedicate your life to pointing them in that direction and keeping them in that way. That means that every day, can I tell you that every day, every day, come back here, Jason. Every day, all right, don't go the way I tell you to go. See that, see that, uh, that door back there? Go to the door. Every day, every day in, 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 the, in the Bragg house, there's every day. And sometimes it goes like that. All right, come back, come back. Every day. Devotion time. Parents, devotion time is one of the best times to do that. Sometimes we go through the motions and we just read, read a Bible or read, read something. But devotion time is a time where you can get around the table and you can get around the word of God and we'd say, hey, what, what happened in school today? What should you have done? What did you do? What should you have done? What's the best way to approach that? How do you think God would want you to do that? And constantly, it's like, Driving an old Ford van that doesn't have a good alignment. You, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You could you smile as soon as I say it. Constantly, constantly. You, you gotta, gotta be constantly. That's, that is what parenting is. The nurture and the admonition. It's not what I want. That's what being a steward of children is. Say, I'd like to have a day off. I can tell you, four children... There's some days, sometimes I wish I had a day off. But soon enough, they'll be gone. And all the days will be off just to stay faithful. All right, so we've talked about for those that do not have children, those who have children. Let me give you finally number three, those who have raised their children. Say, Pastor, could there be anything that the Bible could say about grandchildren? What should I do as a grandparent? <laughs> The Word of God has much to say, actually. Let me say, number one, maintain a godly testimony. Maintain a godly testimony. In Exodus, it's talking about the Lord, and it says that he's keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, that they will be by no means, uh, uh, and that will uh, by no means clear the guilty. Meaning, he will punish the guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children under the third and the fourth generation. I was just reading uh, in my, uh, my Bible reading the other day. I was reading the book of Job. And what did Job do at the beginning? Uh, um, remember when his sons were still alive before they died? Remember what he was doing? He was offering sacrifices just in case. Remember that? Uh, just in case they had, and I can't remember the phrase now, you can go back and look at it, it's in Job 2 or 3, somewhere in there. Uh, but, but, but perchance they had they'd done wrong. Um, he was concerned about his children, even though they were gone, they were raised. And he was, but he was maintaining a godly, uh, a godly testimony. Don't ever think, let me, let, me, let me set this up for a moment. Sometimes we look at people and we think they've done wrong their whole lives, but God's never judged them. How is that possible? According to this passage, sometimes God passes the judgment to the children or the children's children. Don't ever think that because someone has not received judgment for their life or in, in, a, in the time that you think they should receive judgment, um, that they won't receive judgment. This verse tells you that he will not clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children. I certainly, say, Pastor, are you perfect by 
no means, far from it. I certainly want, wouldn't want my actions to bring judgment upon my children or my grandchildren. I'd hate to raise my children and say, hey, you know what, I've done my job, I can do whatever, and then my children or my children's children pay the price because I've let up. I don't have a good testimony anymore. I've stopped walking with the Lord. As a grandparent, you raise your children and say, well, I'm done. Maintain a godly, count, uh, a godly testimony. Stay right with the Lord. God's blessings may be on your children because of your righteousness or because you've lived righteously. Number two, let me say this uh, about parents who've raised their children. Leave, this is not, you, you never hear this preached. I'm just saying it's in the Bible. Leave something for them. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. I'm just telling you, what the, this is what the Bible says. And wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. Um, a good man leaveth an inheritance. Now, a, a, good, a good name is rather be chosen than great riches. So a good name could be left, but this is not talking about a good name. This is literally talking about inheritance. And I realize in the economy it's difficult, but that's a biblical principle here. A good man leaveth an inheritance for his children's children. Leave something for them. Number three, let me say this in regard to parents that have already raised their children. Enjoy their presence. Proverbs 17, 6 says, Children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children are their fathers. If you've raised your children, and you now have children's children, enjoy it. Enjoy it. I can see grandparents all around shaking their heads. Enjoy it. That's what God desires of us. And then number four, let me say this. Forgive and pray for them. Some have children that have not gone the way that they wanted them to go. Galatians chapter 6 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken at fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou be tempted, lest thou also be tempted. Forgive and pray for them. I am thankful for the mercy, the, the tender loving kindness that I received from my parents. I tell you, I'm a bonehead. Some of you that knew me as a teenager, you know, yeah, you're right. And yet, my parents still love me. My parents, they never said, you know what? No longer I'm going to pray for you. No longer I'm, I, no, I'm thankful that my parents uh, uh, still were concerned about me. I'm thankful. Oh, I'm so thankful I have a parents that I know, I know, pray for me. I know it. <laughs> I'm so thankful. Uh, uh, you know what? If, if, if everyone in this church turned their back on the pastor, I know I have parents that pray for me. I'm so thankful for it. And your children need to have that. Your grandchildren need to, need to know that. They need to know it. You know, if everybody else turns their back on them, grandpa, grandma, mima, papa, whatever they all, when I was, when I was growing up, it was grandma brag, grandpa brag, Grandma Getman, Grandpa Getman, it was just Grandma and Grandpa on, in the last name, and now it's all kinds of things. I mean, even my parents. Papa and Grammy are my parents. Gigi. I don't know what Gigi stands for. Anyway, we'll, we'll, go, down that, we'll, go, down, don't, we'll go down that road another time. <laughs> it stands for you. <laughs> the point is, they need to know that Gigi prays for them. Your children, your grandchildren need to know they have a grandparent that prays for them, that is concerned for them, that loves them, that, that is ready, if they're a prodigal, to welcome them back, that's standing on the front porch, ready to welcome them back if they're a prodigal. That is what is being a good steward. You say, Pastor, uh, um, being a steward you talked about all kinds of things. I think being a steward in, in regard to family is not just a parent, but it can go in a lot of areas. And every one of us, I'm afraid sometimes you hear stewardship of family and they say, well, that's for, that's for the, the parents that have teenagers. That's for the parents that have young kids. 
I think all of us can be stewards of family and familial relationships. What we have is comes from God, and we're going to give an account with what we've been given. And so I just want to encourage you, be a good steward of what God's given you. Father in heaven, help us, Lord, I pray. As we enter a time of invitation, help us be faithful stewards. Lord, I pray that a man, uh, that it it be said that a man uh, uh, is found faithful, that a steward is found faithful, Lord, I pray. I pray you bless this time of invitation, and we ask it in Jesus Christ's name. With heads bowed and eyes closed.